All right, today I'm going to be performing the return to Lipsy attack. Uh, it's a sort of buffer overflow attack, which subverts the non-executable countermeasure implemented in Linux. Um, so the first step is going to be to set up the attack. Uh, first, we're going to turn off address base randomization uh, so that we're able to find the addresses without having to do too much work. Um, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to reroute the, uh, the link for the bin shell, there's a dash shell, to a bin zsh. Uh, this <coughs> pretty much avoids a countermeasure for the uh, dash shell, which converts set UID programs, it sets their EUID to its real UID. So the CSH doesn't have that countermeasure, so we won't have to worry about having the set UID changed. Next, I'm going to compile this retlib program, which is the vulnerable program. Um, you can see it has the vulnerability here, has the defined buffer size, but it uh, reads larger than the buffer size. So for this lab, I'm changing the buffer size of this program to 200. Uh, it has the no stack protector, so it won't, uh, won't uh, exit out of the program when it detects stack smashing. And it has non-executable stack, which is what we're trying to get around with this lab. Then we're going to give that uh, retlib program root privilege, as well as making it a set UID program. So for the first task of this lab, I'm going to need to find the addresses for a couple uh, libc functions, which are going to be using later on in the exploit program. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a bad file. This bad file is what's read by the retlib program, and that's where the exploit program is going to write its uh, output which will be fed into the retlib program. So to find the addresses I need, I'm going to be using the uh, GDB debugger from the retlib program. I'm going to run it to populate stack. So now I can print out the variables here, or uh, the functions and their location. So here you can see we've got these two addresses for the system and exit functions. Right, for this task, I'm going to be finding the, well, I'm going to be creating the my shell variable, which we'll uh, be using to point to the bin zsh. And then we'll be finding the address for that variable. So we're using the export command to generate an environment variable. You can see it just creates the string slash bin slash sh. And we can see that it is now an environment variable. Next thing we're going to be doing is we're going to be uh, compiling this task2 program which is just going to print out the address of that uh, of that shell location. There we go. We've got the address, which we can put into our exploit program. All right. So for uh, this task, I'm going to be putting together the exploit program. Uh, and here I've inputted the addresses, which we've got from previous steps. 
and I've inputted these uh, buffer locations. Uh, basically, since the retlib program is buffer size 200, the return graph is going to be 12 bytes beyond that. So first we're going to have the system function, and then uh, we're going to have the exit uh, function running after right after right after that, and then uh, we've got the binsh variable sitting on the tail end, and that's what's going to be read by system to open our root shell. So we can compile this exploit program, and that's going to generate the bad file. It's about to be read by the retlib program, and so retlib opens up the root shell. So the next thing we can do is we can uh, see what happens when there isn't a exit function. So we save that, and then recompile the exploit program. We can see that we still get the root shell. However, when we exit, we're going to get a segmentation fault which uh, could raise red flags to administrators or whoever's watching. Um, so and then the final thing we're going to do is we're going to compile the retlib program with a different name. So here we're going to go new retlib compile that and we give that our root and we're going to give it set UID and then we're going to since the exploit is already compiled the bad file is already there we can just run the new red lib you can see that it has a command not found. It just finds H, which is the very end here of our bin sh string. This means that the uh, address for this bin sh has been moved uh, slightly, and that's because the name of the retlib program has changed and is a little bit longer. All right, so now finally we are going to use the address space randomization. It's going to be turned on. Then we're going to see how that affects how our exploit program runs. So now we're getting a segmentation fault find out why that is, we can rerun this task 2 program. And you can see here that this address location is quite a bit different than the one we got before. And that's because the, uh, the start of the stack has been moved, so all these other values are going to change. So the attack will remain unsuccessful. All right, so now for the hard part. We have task five here. Um, so what this is gonna, task gonna involve is gonna be to turn on this, uh, or reroute this to the uh, dash shell here. Originally reported to the ZSH, which doesn't have the set UID protections, but now we're pointing to the dash shell, which will change the effective user ID of the program to the real user ID, which will mean that it should be uh, able to execute properly. So here we can see when we run the retlib program now, it gives us a normal shell rather than a root shell. This is because the privileges of the program have been changed to just the user ID. So, to get around that, we're going to have to make some changes to the attack program. So, first I've 
got some changes to the Retlib program. It was slightly different. Still going to have the buffer size of 200, but here it's going to print out the address of the buffer and the frame pointer value. Uh, this is the more scientific method of obtaining the values that I had here in the exploit program. Uh, but we also need the frame pointer value as part of the attack program. So what we're going to do first is we're going to compile the stack rock program and then we're going to give it the root ownership and set UID privileges. And then we can run the program. You see that uh, it has the BinSH address, has the address of the buffer, and the frame pointer. So now we can if we look at the attack program here, it's got a few more addresses that we're going to need. I've already put the BinSH address in there, and the address of the buffer, uh, or the frame pointer, rather. So, it's, this also has the exit system uh, functions, but it's also got this uh, set UID function, and so how this is going to work is it's going to uh, before it runs the system command, which calls the, the shell, it's going to set the user ID of the program to zero. And this is going to, well, I guess it's going to give the program root access. Um, the problem is, is that you can't feed a zero directly into the set UID. Um, so you're going to have to use the, uh, the sprintf function, and that's going to break down a series of null characters into a zero, which will then be fed into the set UID program uh, function. And because you aren't able to chain one function to the next, so even if we had uh, the set UID set just after where system was at, it wouldn't be able to, system would be able to call its uh, input and then return and then move on to set UID. We have to do a little bit of uh, manipulation here. So what happens is it goes out uh, to its, uh, to whatever its input is and then it has a leave return command that's going to bring it back to the next function in the chain. Uh, this is explained a little bit more in my, uh, in my lab report, so I'm not going to go too in detail with it now. But I will show how to find these addresses here. Another thing to note is that uh, this value here is set the same, 212. Uh, basically that's just the difference here between the frame, or the frame pointer value and the address of the buffer. Turns out that it's 212 bytes. <coughs> um, so to find the rest of these addresses here, we're going to have to use the GDB debugger. Make a breakpoint at the foo function. Disassemble foo. And we can see here is the address for the leave return function. We're just going to want this one here, and that's input there. Now we can find the addresses for things like sprint f and set uid. System and exit. So that gives us everything we need to input in here. So 
So now all that I have to do is to compile this attack program and run it, and that'll populate the bad file, which is about to be read by the stack rot program. And there we go. It gives us a root shell, even though we are using the dash instead of the ZSH.